Greetings, physics enthusiasts. Welcome to AP Physics 2, Unit 5, Lesson 5, where we are going to talk about flux. Flux is a brand new quantity. It's something we have not discussed before. And it's kind of exciting to be this far into physics and have something brand new. So flux, first of all, let's just say it. Flux is fun to say. So enjoy that. And let's see what we mean when we say flux. Flux is related to a field. Specifically, we're going to be talking about magnetic flux. And so we're going to be looking at a magnetic field. So I could draw a magnetic field lots of different ways. I could have a magnetic field that goes to the right, or I could have a magnetic field that points toward the bottom of the page, or I could have a magnetic field that points into the page, which I draw like this. Or I could have a magnetic field that points out of the page that I draw like this. So lots of different options for field direction. And remember that um, if you ever played darts or shot uh, an arrow, uh, they have little feathers on the back. So this looks like a dart or an arrow going away from you, which is why this represents into the page. And as that dart or arrow is coming toward you, this looks like that pointy part coming toward you. So that's why uh, the dots mean out of the page and the X's mean into the page. I'm going to select the X's or into the page as my field direction. So B field. And that's just easy for me to draw. So flux is related to field strength. In general, greater field strength will be greater flux. But what else is going on? And that's the exciting thing here. The exciting extra thing that's going on is what if I have a loop? My loop could be a circle or my loop could be a square, or my loop could be a rectangle. Let's just draw a circle, just for fun. So here is my loop. And flux is similar to, it's like, it's analogous to how many field lines go through the loop. So flux, is I'm going to say it's proportional to proportional to um, the number of field lines going through the loop. Flux is proportional to the number of field lines going through the loop. So a stronger field would correspond to field lines that are closer together. And that would give me more field lines going through the loop. So a stronger field gives us more flux. And also the area of this loop, if I had a smaller loop, there would be fewer field lines going through it. And if I had a bigger loop, there would be more field lines going through it. So flux is directly proportional to both the strength of the field and the area of the loop. And so that leads us to our definition. Flux, which is abbreviated with this Greek letter phi. So I'm going to write over here on flux phi. I put the abbreviation in parentheses after the word. Flux is defined as, I'm sorry, I've got something in my eye. Flux is defined as capital B, capital A, magnetic field strength times the area of the loop. So if your loop is a circle, I would use pi r squared for that area. If your loop is a rectangle, I would use length times width for that area. If your loop is a square, I would use, um, you know, uh, uh, x squared. Uh, as the area. If your loop is a trapezoid, I would use one half, some of the bases uh, times the height, whatever. It, it, it's the area and you know how to find the area. Now, there is one additional thing that makes this more interesting. 
And that is, I'm going to get out a post-it. Uh, that is how things are oriented relative to one another. So here's my loop. And so now I can move the loop. All of those field lines are going through the loop. What if I turn my loop this way? In turning my loop this way, have I changed B, the magnetic field strength? No, I have not. In turning the loop this way, have I changed A, the area of the circle or of the loop? No, I have not. But do you see that when I turn the loop this way, I have fewer magnetic field lines going through it? And in fact, when the loop is oriented this way, none of the field lines go through the loop. So as I went from here, where I had a flux BA, to here, where I have a flux zero, my flux has changed. My flux decreases, my flux increases, decreases, increases. Or I could do it this way, decreases, keep spinning, increases, decreases, increases, decreases. And so what I want to do is I want to put in uh, something having to do with this angle that this is turning through. Now, you will remember that I said the direction of this plane figure, the direction of the circle, is defined as perpendicular to the paper I drew the plane figure on. So if I get out this pen, lovely pen, um, and I set it down like this, perpendicular to the paper is either out of the paper or into the paper. So the direction of the loop is out of the paper. And the direction of the field is into the paper. So the angle between the field and the loop right now is either 180 or zero. And when I turn the paper 90 degrees, so that there's no flux, what is the angle between the field and the loop? It's 90 degrees. So zero degrees, 90 degrees. Now, I want a lot of flux here. I want the whole flux BA. So what trig function of zero gives me one? And that's why I write cosine theta because the cosine of zero is one. And what trig function of 90 degrees gives me zero? And again, I want cosine because the cosine of 90 is zero. And again, I do not advocate memorizing a whole lot of things. But if this is cosine theta versus theta, the cosine graph looks like this. In other words, when theta is zero, I get one. And when theta has increased to 90, I get zero. That's a graph that I have memorized. So this is our full equation for flux, BA cos theta. Flux is directly proportional to the magnetic field strength and the area. And then sometimes the loop is oriented so that all the field lines go through. And sometimes it's oriented so that none go through. And then in between there, some, but not all go through. So my flux is large, less, 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 zero, more in the other direction. Less, zero, more in the first direction. And by the time I get from here to two pi, I've gone all the way back. All right, so that is our definition of flux. Of course, there are other ways of changing flux. What if I had a magnetic field that was controlled by some, some little dial that I could turn? So I could increase and decrease the magnetic field strength. But um, this is a more common way of doing it. Have a constant magnetic field and a loop that you rotate. All right, so flux is B A cos theta. 
Now, that's flux. Let's look at the unit for flux. This is the abbreviation for flux, right? Phi. So not the. So just like uh, I just want to remind you, uh, when I'm talking about mass, which is abbreviated with an M, the unit for mass is the kilogram. So there's a difference between the abbreviation and the unit, right? So the abbreviation for flux is phi. I want to know about the unit for flux. Well, do you remember the unit for magnetic field? It was Newtons per, what was it that um, a magnetic field pushed on? It pushed on moving charged particles. So Coulomb meters per second. How hard it pushes per amount of charge per how fast they're going. So the unit for magnetic field is Newtons per Coulomb meter per second. The unit for area is square meters. So, and of course the unit for a trig function is it's dimensionless. Trig functions are just numbers. So uh, one of these meters cancels with one of those meters. So I get Newton meter uh, over Coulomb per second. Okay, that's good. Um, and then if you wanted, you could call that a Newton meter per amp because a Coulomb per second is an amp. So all of those would be good units for flux. All right. Now, sometimes the flux changes. In fact, often the flux changes. Remember, I said we've got a loop and a field. And as the loop turns, the flux changes. So what if I wanted to talk about not flux, but the rate of change of flux? The rate of change of flux. So here's flux. The rate of change of flux is the amount that the flux changes by divided by how long it takes that change to happen. So delta flux over time is the rate of change of flux. And that turns out to be a really important thing. I wonder what the unit for rate of change of flux is. Well, we looked at the unit for flux. It was one of these. So the rate of change of flux is just this unit divided by the unit for time, or this unit divided by seconds. So the rate of change of flux, the unit for the rate of change of flux, um, there were our flux units. So we could do Newtons meters squared over Coulombs meters per second, and then just put another seconds in the bottom to be that, the unit for time. So that's a lot right there. I want to show you what that happens to be equal to. And I'm just going to tell you the answer, and then I'll prove it to you. The answer is that this unit is a volt. This unit here, the unit for rate of change of flux, is the same as the unit for electric potential. Remember that? That we called the volt. So um, remember, a volt was a joule, right, per coulomb. So how can I make this turn into a joule per coulomb? Well, I'm going to cancel this 2 and this m, right? And I'm going to cancel this second and this second. And what I'm left with is a newton meter per coulomb. But what did we call a Newton meter? We called that a joule, and there's a Coulomb. And a joule per Coulomb is a volt. <laughs> so that wasn't too hard to prove. Um, so the unit for rate of change of flux 
is the volt. It's the same unit as a battery has. You know, you've got a three volt battery or a nine volt battery or a 12 volt battery. Um, this is the unit for what we called electric potential, which we often abbreviate, you know, with that epsilon or EMF. I know a lot of names for the same thing. Sorry about that. That's kind of weird. So the rate of change of flux is voltage. And so what is actually happening with that, with the rate of change of flux being voltage is, here is a loop. If this is a loop of wire, so it's a circuit, if the wire just sits there in a magnetic field, nothing happens. But if a wire sits there in a magnetic field and the wire turns such that the flux changes, there's flux, flux doesn't cause anything. But a change in flux will cause a current in this wire. And it will cause a current in the wire as if there's a battery there. I'm drawing a battery. There is not really a battery. But what would a battery cause? Current. So just like a battery that would have a potential or an EMF or a voltage, just like a battery would cause a current, changing the flux will cause a current. How much current will it cause? It will cause the same amount of current as if there were a battery there of a certain potential. How much potential? the rate of change of flux. So what I can say is there isn't really a battery there. So maybe I'm gonna draw, I'm gonna draw dotted lines like a battery. It's a pretend battery. There is not really a battery there. There's a pretend battery with a potential. There's a dotted epsilon, a pretend epsilon there. Here, let's make that a little darker so you can see it. So if I had a circuit, with a battery of potential um, or EMF or voltage epsilon. There would be a current in there. What's the resistance of the circuit? What's the battery voltage? And then I would use Ohm's law, V equals IR or I, the current in the circuit would be directly proportional to the EMF and inversely proportional to the resistance. And so now I can say, just like that in this circuit over here, I have my loop with no battery, but there's still a resistance R. And if my loop is rotating, I'm still gonna have a current I in that loop that turns with the potential is now equal to the rate of change of flux. Delta flux over time, over R. So isn't that exciting? The potential, there is no battery, but it's as if there were a battery whose voltage is the rate of change of flux. So there you have it. Um, yeah, I think that's all I need to say about that. Um, so this and this, I, voltage, resistance. So the rate of change of flux is like the voltage. There isn't really a battery here. There's a pretend battery. Um, and so this rate of change of flux is sometimes called induced, we're forcing it to happen, induced EMF or induced voltage. 
rate of change of flux, induced EMF, induced voltage. The equation for that, so induced EMF voltage, is delta phi over T. Now, there's two more parts to this. One is if instead of having one loop of wire, if I have multiple loops of wire, each loop gets that current. So I'm going to put a capital N for the number of loops. And then I'm going to put a minus sign here. And I'm going to talk about the minus sign in the next video. But the minus sign has to do with what is called lenses, L-E-N-Z, apostrophe S, law. Did I spell that right? Is lenses law, L-E-N-S or L-E-N-Z? Goodness gracious, I'm having a blank on that. You can check the spelling and I'll check it for next time. Lenses law. That's what the minus sign is. Again, I'm gonna explain that in the next video. This whole equation is called Faraday's law. And that's all you need to know about Faraday, who was some you know, famous scientist who's not living anymore. Um, uh, but that this equation is named after him. And there you have it. That is our lesson for today. I hope that blew your mind just a little bit, that just turning the loop will induce or force there to be a current. And the rate of change of flux has the unit voltage. The rate of change of flux is the voltage of the pretend battery. Okie dokie, that's all I have for you. I will see you next time when I teach you both how to spell and how to understand Lenz's law. Have a great day. Don't break the laws of physics.